is Kaya Briggs for Russian East TV and this is my pleasure to talk with Gita Sagal. Hi Gita, how are you? I'm very well and very pleased to meet you because I know you're embattled in Poland and these battles are being fought everywhere in the world at the moment. Thank you for your kind words of support. We are actually curious about the situation in India right now. Uh, as we are aware that uh, the nationalism in India and the, the fanatic Hinduism is taking over in the country. Could you brief us a little bit about it? Well, you know, I think it's important to remember that India had a very plural nationalist movement. The movement that fought the British was uh, one based on uh, plural identities, no state religion, a constitution that promised equality and no religion uh, in the state. And what's happening now is that the government that has taken power is a government of a very right-wing Hindu party influenced by fascism. It started in the 20s and 30s, uh, you know, it's contemporary with modern Nazism and fascism, uh, strongly influenced by a very narrow blood and soil nationalism which wants India to be a Hindu nation not a nation of all peoples that live in it uh, and where people can be any religion or none it wants to have a Hindu nation which and destroy the constitution of India it's a very serious situation how powerful are they the government is extremely powerful because it's not just a government and it's not simply a populist movement like Trump which is riding a wave there are very, very organized militias behind them, organized groupings of the Hindu right. It's called the Hindutva movement, if you heard that word. It doesn't mean any Hindu. There are many things wrong with traditional Hinduism, like the caste system and a lot of superstition. But this is a, a movement of deliberate violence, particularly against minorities, particularly against the most marginalized communities, the so-called untouchables, known as the Dalits. Um, it's, it's a very, very violent movement. Uh, it believes in the subjugation of women. Uh, and as I said, it believes in destroying the constitution of India and the scientific temper, which was actually uh, very much part of the foundation of the Indian state. Uh, so the temper of rationalism, the scientific temper, scientific inquiry, uh, it, it, it wants to put superstition in place of inquiry in exactly the same way as the Christian right does with creationism. The Hindu fundamentalists are doing that in India. They're also killing people, they're killing people that they deem to be beef eaters because they want to hold the cow sacred. Uh, but instead of protecting the cow in terms of uh, you know, animal husbandry, having better conditions in animal farming and things like that, uh, which I would agree with, they want to kill people who eat beef or who they say are beef eaters, which basically means an excuse for killing Muslims, any Muslim anywhere that any mob decides is a beef eater. Uh, and people are being killed, rationalists are being killed, uh, individually assassinated because they wrote against the religious scriptures, you know, they, they were scholars of the scriptures in some cases, or they challenged superstition, they challenged um, all kinds of practices that was thought to be miraculous and so on. Those kind of people have been three, at least three people have been killed. Writers have been stopped from writing because they challenged the uh, scriptural views of women. Um, they were, you know, very, uh, they, they, well, they wrote novels, you know, which, which challenged uh, the way society is. And uh, so they've been stopped. There is a civil rights movement in India which has spoken out against these things. So many writers gave up their awards in protest against this uh, atmosphere of, of uh, increasing religious fundamentalism and, and, and the shutting down of inquiry and uh, the scientific temper. And many scientists have protested as well. But unfortunately, the government is beginning through its uh, uh, support from various rich corporate media magnates and so on to control a lot of the media, to, to push out independent voices, to control the scientific institutions, to control the writing of history, uh, to control every area of civil society. And India has had a tradition of a very rich, vibrant scientific life and uh, a life of the humanities and the arts. And so it's, I can't say it's under control because there are movements against it, People are speaking out, but the government's writ of this Hindu right-wing fundamentalist extremist party is uh, everywhere. And unfortunately, many Western governments think of it as an ally and a government that's leading a democratic nation. And what they're doing is destroying democracy from within. But how can they see it as an ally? In, in which sense? 
because governments are fighting Muslim fundamentalism. So some governments see, see it as an ally against Muslim fundamentalism. In Britain, we have the context of Brexit. Um, and the, the, these Hindu right groups are very active over here. They, they have supporters in the British cabinet. They have supporters in the Labour Party. So they have supporters across the political spectrum. And uh, they, they lobby for uh, the government, the Hindu right government, and for Hindu interests in Britain. Uh, so, for instance, they do not want caste discrimination to be prosecuted, prosecutable in Britain. Uh, first they say caste doesn't exist in this country. And then they say, but if you bring it in, you will be the ones causing uh, discord in this country. And what we're saying is that there, there is caste discrimination. Uh, that is, you know, uh, Hinduism traditionally divides people into different castes with different places. And some people are considered outcast and therefore have are not, don't have full human rights. And the Hindu lobby in this country wants to maintain that situation. They want to pretend it doesn't exist and therefore to maintain that situation. And the government sees India as a place where they can invest money or where, indeed where Indians might be persuaded to invest money in Britain. And it's quite desperate leaving the EU. Uh, so it sees it as an ally there and it sees it as an ally in the war on terror uh, against Muslim fundamentalism. But actually they're encouraging Muslim fundamentalism by the way they're behaving. Uh, are they also targeting other religion, uh, religious minorities? Uh, actually, if you could maybe tell us, because I'm not sure if all of our viewers know how many religions there are in India. There are many, many religions in India. One is that Hinduism is not one thing. It's many different things. And so they're targeting everybody who doesn't conform to their idea of Hinduism. Uh, that's one thing. Then they're targeting Muslims, definitely. They're the main target. and they're. India is actually one of the largest Muslim countries in the world. There are about 200 million Muslims in India, again of different classes and castes and, and different kinds of practices. Uh, there are 20, 30 million Christians in India. They're also being targeted because they're considered outsiders. So what the, just like the Muslim fundamentalists, they say we invite you to join our religion. If you come back to the Hindu fold, we, w we won't attack you. You know, so the, there's the invitation. First, there's the invitation. Come back to us. If you don't agree, then you're fair game. So those two are the major groups being attacked, but they're also Persian descended group called the Parsis, a very small group of people. They're Buddhists, they're Jains. Many of the people from the outcast classes became Buddhists in protest against Hinduism. Some of them became Christians. Some in earlier years converted to Islam. Many now convert to Buddhism, which they see as a rationalist religion. Uh, uh, which was against discrimination. So they convert to that as a form of uh, religion to be. So they're being targeted as well. Like, join us, our version of Hinduism, uh, uh, or, you know, we'll, we'll attack you as well. So India is religiously very varied. And what they're wanting to do is convert it into, like, some form of Islamic fundamentalism with one book, one holy place, one set of practices, one worship. And even traditional Hinduism wasn't like that. People had all kinds of beliefs, including rationalist beliefs within Hinduism, atheist beliefs within Hinduism, but they won't allow those kind of beliefs to exist. Could you tell us a bit more about this atheism and rationalism within the Hindu tradition? I'm not, I'm not very good on the Hindu tradition because I'm not a philosopher of it. But the point is that anybody who's studied the Hindu text knows that you can find many nascent ideas including uh, ideas around, you know, uh, having a practice without God. So theism wasn't necessarily the center of some forms of Hinduism. You didn't have to profess uh, a belief in God as you do with Christianity and Islam. But of course, some people believe in specific forms of God. Some people believe in a formless God. So there, there were various uh, different forms of belief. And those are philosophically very interesting to study. I mean, I think those aspects of Hinduism, I come from a Hindu tradition. I am an atheist. I, you know, I don't believe in God, but I also criticize a lot of Hindu practice, the caste system uh, uh, and, and the fundamental inequalities that are rooted in Hindu practices. But that doesn't mean that there aren't philosophical traditions that it isn't interesting to explore. Uh, it is interesting to look at some of those and artists and writers, dancers, singers, I mean they look at the, the um, traditional texts of uh, 
uh, dance and uh, music and things like that. And they get a lot of um, ideas out of them that they say that modern philosophers are exploring in the West, but they actually find some of these um, in the text. So actually what they're doing is dumbing down a very interesting set of philosophical practices to a violent, nasty, hierarchical, authoritarian religion. Are there many atheists and rationalists in India? Do, are there any statistics on how many people are actually non-believers or free thinkers? I don't. Uh, the rationalist societies in India may have some statistics. Uh, I'm afraid I can't give you any now, but I know there's a long tradition of rationalism. Um, some of the Indians, like M. N. Roy, um, he he was a rationalist in the uh, in the in the 20s, and in fact, he debated with Lenin about Lenin promoting the jihadis of its time, you know, of their time, sort of supporting Muslim fundamentalism against the British and other empires. And he said, don't do this, don't get mixed up with uh, religious leaders and things like that, because you think they might pursue your goals right now. They, they, don't, they will not pursue any progressive goal ultimately. So there are all sorts of people who, who have been part of that tradition um, uh, in India and who are still existing now. They're rationalists at the conference who uh, produce magazines in particular regional languages that sell like 20,000 copies, they have hundreds of people coming to their meetings. There's a hunger for that. You know, at the same time as people are getting indoctrinated in right-wing Hindu ideas, they're also counter to that. They're people who are absolutely desperate to explode some of these ideas and not, not to uh, think in those ways. But I couldn't give you a figure on the rationalists and all I know is that rationalists are under threat because writers who are rationalists are being shot and uh, you know, targeted for individual assassinations, um, novelists, uh, Dalit, that is people who from the so-called outcast classes uh, who are very vulnerable. So writers in the villages have been attacked by mobs uh, and you know, they don't get the publicity that the more upper class writers do. Um, so it's, it's a dangerous situation, but the thinking is there. I mean, even in, historically in India, there were anti-caste movements. So they stayed within the Hindu fold, but they challenged caste and the caste hierarchies and things like that. So, they, you know, there have been a lot of movements over time which raised issues of rationalism within uh, those movements. And so there are some political parties based on, on those movements. And just to get a full picture of this, uh, well, fanatic nationalist Hindu movement right now, uh, the Hindutva, is that correct? Uh, so, what what the world should look like according to them? What how what the state should look like? What should be the position of women? What should be um, the situation uh, when it comes to the caste system? If you could give us an idea of this image of a perfect image <laughs> for them. Well, you know, it's a, it's a very frightening because they talk with different faces. So. To some people, they'll say, oh, we, we're against violence against women and, you know, we don't like, uh, you know, they, they'll speak a very modern language. They're capable of doing that. And yet we know they believe that women shouldn't leave the home. They actually have a lot of women leaders who do leave the home, but they propagate this idea that women should be housewives. They shouldn't wear um, provocative clothes. It's their fault if they're out on the street and they get raped um, and so on. So they say those kinds of things. Then they say they want a uniform civil code. Now, that is actually a very secular demand to have one law for everybody to govern citizenship, family, inheritance, marriage, etc. And it was there in the constitutional principles, but it was never enacted into law in India. So they take this demand, which is a very progressive demand, but actually what they want to do is impose Hindu law on everybody. So it's, it's, it's uh, dangerous in their hands. Unfortunately, a lot of people have reacted by saying, no, no, everybody should keep their own laws. And I think from the point of view of an atheist and a secularist and a rationalist, that we, should, we need to create a different discourse and say, no, we don't agree with what they're saying because they want to impose their majority rule. But we need to have a democratic discussion about having common laws where women are not uh, uh, subjugated in any community and they're not citizens are not seen as primarily belonging to a religious community because India doesn't have a state religion but still the legacy of colonialism was that that all our marriage and inheritance laws uh, and things like child custody are within 
uh, within the, a religious framework. And that's very bad. So we need to get away from that. But under, the, under this Hindu nationalist government, it's very difficult to have a logical conversation about it. So their vision of the state is that they control every branch of the state, that they produce textbooks and science, scientific books, in terms of the ideologies that they believe. They have their own theories of creationism. They have their own theories of the early origins of uh, uh, various societies in India. Uh, they see Aryans who, there's a lot of debate about exactly who they were, which is a scientific debate, but they basically see them as the earliest Indians, that they're the original indigenous Indians. And most of the archaeology and linguistic work and so on would not say that you know, they came from Central Asia into India. They were not the most indigenous original Indians. But, but Hindutva ideology demands that they were the original Indians. So they'll overturn all the scientific evidence for that. So the, their ideal society, only their views would be propagated, only their science, only their history, and literature would be severely circumscribed and everything else would be deemed anti-national. Anybody who didn't convert to that form of Hinduism, uh, be they atheists, rationalists, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, etc., would have to be you know, under that demand. And they, would, they say that they're not for caste, but actually they're reimposing the caste system in new ways. And they're saying to Dalits, that is the so-called outcast caste, if you, uh, you know, come and join us, and then they use them as foot soldiers in the riots. That's the most tragic thing, that some of the most marginalized groups who they recruited, they used them to go and kill other people, uh, to kill Muslims. Um, and, and, you know, that's how toxic it is. So uh, there's no progressive version in their mind of coming from, you know, of getting rid of caste. It's reimposing a different form of caste identity uh, under this sort of one nation Hinduism. It's, it's, it's actually reimposing certain traditional forms of Hinduism in, in even more toxic ways than traditionally. Well, that really sounds horrible. Um, is there anything we could do to help? Well, I think it's really good to spread the word about this because uh, I work on Muslim fundamentalism as well. So I, I you know, I, I think that's also a danger. It's also there in India. I mean, all these groups have, the, you know, the evangelical Christians mobilizing in India as well. And of course, there you can see them as a, as an oppressed group. But then they're also promoting creationism and so on. They're not, they're not dangerous in terms of the state, but they're also creating a very conservative narrative within the the communities that they're proselytizing in. So. It, it's just useful if you spread the word because people don't know about India. They think uh, fundamentalism is only the monotheist religions. You know, it's only Judaism, Christianity, Islam that can produce a fundamentalist religion. You can have a religion as plural as Hinduism with so many different facets to it and yet it can produce a political movement that's very narrowing like this. And people don't understand that. They, the, these Hindutva people are very active in the diaspora abroad in Western Europe, in Britain, in America, speaking on behalf of all Hindus. You know, they are the Hindu lobby. So it's very useful to be able to know that they don't speak for everybody. They speak for a very particular political ideology, which is very closely allied to very classic fascism. And you should be wary of it. Thank you very much. We will then try to spread the word and, well, we hope no one else will be assassined for, for the scientific or for any other reason, in fact. So, good luck. And you. And you. Because I know you have a struggle in Poland as well. Yes. Thank you.